so good morning, everyone. I'm like so excited to be here that you cannot imagine. I'm in a, I'm in a big high because yesterday I learned so many new things that I didn't have idea that I'm like, oh my God, what do we do to make this happen and to you know, like use all these in the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement. So today is a very important day in the world. Do you know what is happening today? Strike. So today is the global climate strike. It is actually a quite important day for all of us. Like, I hope that millions of people are going to go out in the street and are going to demand for climate action. We need at this moment, not like in Earth, we need a radical change on the way how we are doing things. We really need to move from the business as usual to start to do things that will change radically the way how things work. And the whole community is a big part of it. Like you have a massive role in climate action. So even if we won't be able to be in the actual climate strike, from here, we're actually doing a lot of climate action. So yesterday, we launched a very important report. So this is very hot from the press. Yesterday, the IFRC president, together with my colleague from the Climate Center in New York, we launched this very important re report that we did together with the World Bank, in which we looked into what is going to be the cost of doing nothing. Like, what if we just continue with the business as usual? No, like with our regular, no, like kind of like current way how we do humanitarian action uh, and development. And these are the costs that we found out, which are like quite striking. So, 100 million people, like 108 million people at the moment, no, like are uh, supported by humanitarian aid. And by 2030, most probably, the double of, of, of that number will be in need, which is, it, you are the mappers, you might be like very good what, not, what that number represents, but it's more or less the size of the population of Brazil. So imagine, by 2013, the population in Brazil will be likely in humanitarian need if we don't do anything. And when we talk about the cost of it, we're talking about potentially by 2013, the humanitarian cost will be around 20 billion. At the moment, the humanitarian cost of operations is very difficult to calculate, but in average, it's like between 3.5 and 12 billion. And this scenario is kind of like not the worst case scenario. So this is like 20, we're talking about 20 billion in, in few years time, somehow, which will be a massive burden in, in, in basically in, in, in development in general. So with this, and I think I recall, it was fascinating to, to see all the facts from your presentation and all the evolution and, and the work that you are doing. It is clearly that the work that each of you are doing are really contributing to be able to have climate smart disaster risk reduction, that we are able really to take like climate action into every single step of what we're doing, what, what, what you're doing. And, and, and it's great that it's, you know, like you can see the tangible benefits at the moment of, of what you're doing. So when Rebecca said that I'm like, I was such a big fan of like OSM, so it's, so it's the reality because I have seen with my own eyes and my own experience, like all the evolution and all the use of all the work that you have been doing for many years. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit my journey in OSM. It's not necessarily that incredible, that's probably the, the journey of many of you. But I used to work in Colombia, I'm from Colombia. And I used to work uh, in the north of Colombia, that's the border with Venezuela, in 2007, 2006, 2007, mainly focused on the post, uh, like the, the post conflict with the paramilitars. It was a quite complex area. I think there are some Colombian fellows here who might know very well, like that, that area. So what we used to do at the, at the United Nations Office for Security was to do the monitoring of the conflict. So we had that map, which I actually put with my own hands. And then we created that map and we were doing the day-to-day -day monitoring and then put in like, okay, there is a, a specific hazard, boom. There is a area of conflict, boom. There is, so everything that was happening, like a situational map, 
to try to understand you know, like what was going on and you know, like all the different like, aspects. So for us to be aware of uh, where, where we need to you know, like put, put attention and how like, risks were changing over time. But at the same time, I was like, there has to be a better way to do this. We can't, like that map is just ridiculous. Because that map is just like, okay, yeah, beautiful topography. We understand, like, where is the people? Where are the houses? Where, no, like, so that, and, and I always had that feeling with me that there should be something nice. But I didn't have an idea about OSM by then. But then, a few years after, uh, so I arrived to Haiti, and I started to work with the shelter cluster, which I think some of you might have worked with the shelter cluster at that time. Is there is someone here that was very involved with the cluster? Haiti emergency operation, some of you. So one of the most amazing things that happened when uh, the, the, the earthquake like, happened is that, of course, that map from Leogan, like the best map, it didn't exist, as you all know. And it was just like a few weeks after, you know, and, and, and over you no know, like the months, and then suddenly, like, boom, we have this brilliant map in an area that it was very, the coordination for shelter was so complex because there were so many different actors. It was so chaotic. We didn't even have the division of the, of the different municipalities. We didn't have like anything. So the creation of that map has such a big impact on the way how we did a shelter coordination in Haiti that was absolutely mind blowing for me. It was like, wow, like this is just like the most amazing like thing that I've ever seen. And then after, I went to Uganda, and then I arrived to Uganda, I was doing more of a long-term like, project there, and then I learned about what the American Red Cross and the Uganda Red Cross was doing in the north of Uganda, like mapping, but more on a long-term project that really focused on uh, fire hazards. And they were starting to train volunteers in a uh, not from Uganda Red Cross in the north of Uganda, and they start to map this beautiful city of Gulu, and, and they come up with these incredible maps, and I was like, wow, this is just the best thing. Because I was working in disaster risk reduction, and this is the basis to be able to do disaster risk reduction planning. And it was like, wow, this is just like the most incredible thing. So when Haiyan happened, and I arrived to the Philippines, the first thing that I did is like, OSM team, I need to meet these guys. I really need to know what they are doing. I need to learn you know, like what is happening in the Philippines. So then I met with the OSM maps, including Faye, who is here. And she was not in the picture, but she's here now. Um, and then basically, you know, like, so they, I learned about like, all the incredible things that they were doing in the, in the Philippines and, uh, and the massive mapping efforts. And the, the Red Cross operation uh, in the Philippines had a big component of uh, disaster risk reduction within the recovery, which it should be in all the operations. And uh, one of the, the key aspects was like, how do we make sure that we have like proper community mapping to be able to do the reconstruction plans and the disaster risk reduction plans within the reconstru reconstruction process? So it was just very beautiful that with the support of the, of the Philippines OSM team, we just like started to map very remote islands, like really maps that are like, were absolutely like out of the loop. And then we started to develop like what you basically do normally, like these beautiful, amazing maps that are used by the municipalities in those remote islands to do the disaster risk reduction plans for the government, like the official disaster risk reduction plan. And that is used in the context of recovery. So, that was just like for me fascinating, like looking through all these years, how OSM is used in response, how it is used for development, how it is used for recovery planning. So it was just like, wow. So during the last few years, I have been working mainly with many of my colleagues, like for instance with the German Red Cross, my colleagues that are here sitting with the Federation and other Red Crosses in the world of like, how can we make humanitarian aid more efficient? How can we anticipate disasters? So rather than just like waiting to the disaster to happen and do the traditional operations that we do, how can we use science and risk information like more wisely to be able to take better decisions? And when I say it like science, like focus science and, uh, and risk information, one core element of that is actually OSM because it's one of the exposure 
like layers and vulnerability are actually you know, like, are within OSM. So there is a massive power within OSM to be able to contribute to this big transformation that we want to do in the humanitarian sector, not only within the Red Cross, but across all the different humanitarian agencies. So, so we're working on this. It's like very exciting. We are developing. We have like 22 countries. We were developing this, this type of uh, methodologies. And we are, yeah, learning, learning, learning. So I bring this image because this is a Mozambique this year. Uh, so one of my colleagues actually took this picture. And I just want to bring a reflection to all of you. But if we're talking about like, how can we anticipate disaster? How can we be like, better doing humanitarian like, response? You know, like, what do we need to do as, an, as a humanitarian open street map community to make that, I mean, to minimize you know, like, that, that this happened? You know, like, how can we make you know, like, the, the, the mapping process and this community engagement and the use of technology you know, like, to the full use at a scale, oh sorry, at a scale to be able you know, like, to have like a massive large impact. So we're talking about like really being able to scale up a lot of the work that you're doing to be able you know, like, to reach as much as, 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 as people uh, in need and at risk as we can. So with this, these are like few takeaway ideas that I think are very, that I would love to share with you in terms of like the role of, so, of OSM in climate action. You no, know, like how with all the work that you're already doing, you no, know, like, I mean, what, what else we could do to take these efforts up to a scale? So from one side, I think that understanding that OSM is extremely powerful in the entire disaster risk management process is very important. So it's not only for the response, but it's just absolutely important across the whole spectrum. Uh, the, going back to the scaling up process, like we have been in the Red Cross. We're very used to have like a project here, a project there, we map here, we map there. The question is like, okay, how do we bring this up to scale? How do we cover entire at risk areas? so we can have better decision-making processes. And you have fantastic like, technological tools that will definitely help that, but that has to be also together with the community component. No less. So technology has a limit and it's brilliant, but there, the, the community component, which in the Red Cross is represented by the volunteers, is, is great. So if we put together you know, like all that amazing things that you are doing, with the, how many volunteers do we have look in the Red Cross? 13.7 million, billion, million volunteers in the Red Cross. So if we put, imagine if we put all this together and that every single volunteer you know, is training OSM, we can do wonders. Yeah, so then together with this idea of like engaging the volunteers, of course we need like massive capacity building. So it's not like we need to make sure that there is sustainability on the way how, how communities and, and, and volunteers are engaged into the, into the mapping process. Um, and uh, I, I also want to like highlight again, like the importance of OSM for like climate smart disaster risk reduction. Like if we, I mean, if we manage that at least within the Red Cross, uh, all the different climate smart disaster risk reduction projects that we have include an OSM component, like I think we will get like very far. And my last thing, which is like very close to my heart, which is this topic of focus-based financing and anticipation, is like how can we do to make sure that all the anticipatory work that we are doing in the Red Cross will include OSM as a strategic area. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.